Hi, everybody. My name is Melissa Palmer. I'm a senior technologist in the office of the CTO of Veeam Software, and I'm also a VMware certified design expert. You can find me on Twitter at Veeamist33. So if you have any questions, feel free to tweet me. And today, we're going to be talking about getting ready for ransomware with a special spin, because we're gonna be talking about getting ready for ransomware in the context of VMware. So let's get started. Something I've been saying for the last year or so is that ransomware is a disaster. And if you really think about it, ransomware is a disaster, but it's a disaster that's more likely to happen than anything we've traditionally planned for. It's more likely to happen than, you know, a fire or a natural disaster or equipment breaking. It's a disaster that's always kind of looming. And a lot of times people ask me, well, what do I do? How do I start getting ready for ransomware? And the answer is, first, you need to understand that ransomware is a disaster. After we've put things in that context, now we know our starting point for ransomware recovery is our disaster recovery plan. Now that comes with a couple caveats that we'll talk about in a little bit, but most importantly, we need to have disaster recovery plans that we can execute if a disaster like ransomware strikes. So let's go over some practical tips for either updating your disaster recovery plan or creating a new disaster recovery plan wherever you are in your disaster recovery journey. These tips are really gonna help you out. First things first is know your data. You need to know your RPOs and RTOs for each application. If you're not familiar with these acronyms, RPO is your recovery point objective or the point in time you're going to recover to. And RTO is your recovery time objective or how long is it going to take you to recover? Now, each application is gonna have different RPOs and RTOs based on a number of things, but usually it ties back to business requirements and dollar amount, right? Because downtime costs money. So those critical applications that make your organization money or have something to do with uh, health and welfare of human life, right? Those are probably going to have very low RPOs and RTOs, which means you can't, you, you can't lose a lot of data and you need to recover it really fast. Now, once you have a solid understanding of RPO and RTO, there's a bunch of different ways to meet them, to meet your business requirements at the same time, right? So let's take an RPO of 30 minutes. Uh, that's pretty valid for a lot of more critical applications, but I can't lose 30 minutes of data. So how do I make sure I do that? Couple things pop into my mind immediately. Uh, one is software replication, right? Replicating those virtual machines someplace else. And the second is storage replication, right? Replicating those volumes this, those virtual machines live on. Now, either of those technologies can give me that 30 minute RPO and even more aggressive if I needed to, but which technology I choose again, is gonna tie back to those business values, it's gonna tie back to how much it's gonna cost me, and it's gonna tie back into softer things like what is my staff well trained on? What is my operations team comfortable with using, right? There's lots of different costs besides the solution itself. There's also a cost of the people running the solution. So there's a lot of different ways to meet those RPOs and RTOs once you figure them out. And then you need to know if you're meeting them, right? We need to validate these RPOs and RTOs through checking and testing, making sure that we're able to meet them and then know where you're recovering. We might have a bunch of different recovery scenarios, right? Because if our uh, power grid is offline and both data centers are on the same power grid in our organization, well, we're gonna need a third recovery location to plan for that contingency, right? So also knowing all of the different recovery options up front and kind of testing those out as well is very important. So knowing our data, knowing how to protect it and meet our RPO and RTO, validate that we're meeting them, and then know our different recovery scenarios should different types of disaster happen. Next, of course, is to have a disaster recovery plan. If you wanna use a disaster recovery plan to recover from ransomware, it needs to be well-documented, up-to-date, and recently and thoroughly tested. My little thing I like to say is if you like it, then you should have had a DR plan on it. 
It's not enough to just create that disaster recovery plan though. We always need to be testing it and updating it to make sure it's accurate because let's face it, things change. It is so easy to just go deploy a bunch of new VMs for an application. We need to make sure that they're protected by disaster recovery plans, of course. And then, like I said, every disaster is different. Ransomware could be different than a fire or a hardware failure or a flood or corruption or a storm, right? So when we talk about those disaster recovery plans, thinking of who's going to respond to those disasters? Is it gonna be an all hands on deck situation? Is it gonna be a natural disaster where our staff members won't be able to get to work or won't have access to remote into our systems? So kind of thinking as part of our disaster recovery planning, what are all the different scenarios I need to recover under? And um, how am I gonna treat them differently, right? That's also really, really important. Now, something I spend a lot of time talking about is that VMware is a target. And I'm not just talking about your virtual machines. Your virtual machines are always a target because to an attacker, they just look like any other server on the network, right? I mean your VMware infrastructure. I mean ESXi and vCenter, they are targets. If you do any uh, threat intelligence research out there, you will see that there have been leaks from several ransomware organizations of their playbooks. And in these playbooks, they give their affiliates detailed steps on how to break into a VMware environment and how to destroy it. And we all know that if someone gets into one host, one VMware host, your whole cluster is done, right? Because of the shared storage, they can get in there and encrypt basically every VM very, very quickly. So we need to know that our VMware environments are a target. Uh, VMware has a great resource for ransomware. If you just Google VMware ransomware, it's like the first result and they have like a ransomware resource center. We need to take a look at that, make sure that we're paying attention to VMware security guidance. But more importantly, more than anything, we need to be able to recover more than just VMs. We need to recover that VMware infrastructure before we can recover any of the VMs that were encrypted, right? Because if someone was in our VMware environment, it's trashed. We need to start over. And that means that automated deployment and configuration of these environments is key. I know a lot of people that, you know, you go deploy VMware once and you never really need to touch it again because it's so simple to update with uh, Lifecycle Manager, right? So I'll go, I'll build my cluster, it's running along, I'm updating it, everything's happy, but what happens if I have to start over? And that's where this automated deployment and configuration testing comes into play. Now, one important thing is to remember is you don't necessarily need extra hardware to be able to do this. If you can get some test hosts to mess around with, that's great. But remember, you can test the deployment and configuration of VMware nested, right? So run those ESXi hosts as VMs and test deployment and configuration because we really need to understand the RTO of VMware. If I have four clusters and that means I have 32 ESXi hosts, how long does it take me to rebuild that infrastructure, rebuild that vCenter, rebuild all of that stuff before I can start rebuilding VMs or restoring VMs from backup, right? That's gonna tie into our overall RTO of our applications. We need to understand that RTO of the VMware environment itself. And that also comes back to where will you recover, right? Are you recovering to your disaster recovery site? Are you recovering to a co-located facility or a service provider? Are you recovering to a VMware cloud solution? Uh, one thing that I really love about any of the VMware cloud solutions is how simple they are, right? Always keep a couple hosts running up there, two hosts have everything that you need on there to bootstrap your environment. And then if disaster does strike and you need to start recovery, you can spin up that environment, scale it in like about an hour, right? Start building those new ESXi hosts up in the cloud, and then you have a place to recover to. Because something that some people don't actually plan for is, okay, let's say I do get ransomware and uh, law enforcement has to get involved. They can actually come in and quarantine your on-prem environment, even if you have a DR site, right? If there's signs that those hackers were in that site, when they deploy the ransomware, you're not gonna be able to touch anything. That's why it's so important to look at our different recovery options, again, for service providers, for co-located facilities, for VMware Cloud, et cetera. So it's not just about recovering those VMs, it's being able to recover those vSphere hosts and that vCenter itself as well. 
So now that we've set the stage a little bit, I kind of want to talk about what to do before and after ransomware strikes with the last line of defense with Veeam. Now, if you know Veeam, you probably are familiar with uh, a product called Veeam Backup and Replication, right? That is our flagship product that does, uh, it does backup, it does replication, it does uh, continuous data protection, which is like near zero RPO replication. It does all sorts of things, really. That's where people protect their VMs. But we have additional products that can also help as well. So we have Veeam One, which is monitoring and analytics, not only for your VMware environment, but for your Veeam backup and replication environment. And we also have Veeam Disaster Recovery Orchestrator, which is all about automated disaster recovery planning and testing. So now I want to kind of go through a workflow of protecting your virtual machines. We'll start with backup and replication. We'll talk about Veeam One and we'll talk about Orchestrator and kind of how to build that bigger picture. And it's really important to stay, take the steps you need to today so you can protect yourself from ransomware tomorrow, right? Because if not everything is backed up and protected today, there's nowhere you're going to recover it. First, I wanna talk about real quick, the zip code of availability. I have stolen that term from Rick Vanover. Um, and you might've heard the three, two, one rule of backup, right? So I need three different copies of data, two different media, one offsite copy. When we talk about ransomware, we like to add a couple of more things to make sure that you're really able to recover. One copy of data, at least, that is offline air-gapped or immutable, and then zero errors after automated backup testing and recoverability verification. I remember uh, earlier in my career, I was a systems engineer for a storage company, and I was working on a, a storage array for a backup system, and they were very, very insistent that their backups had to run in a certain amount of time. And everything I was doing was to make the backups fast enough. And so one of the more senior people in my organization said, who specialized in data protection said, well, backup is fine, Melissa, but what about recovery? How long is it going to take them to recover? And that's something that really stuck with me, right? It kind of stuck with me throughout my whole career. And it's not about backup, but it's making sure that we are able to use those backups when disaster strikes. So let's talk about protecting your data with Veeam backup and replication, right? The first thing we need to do is choose your data protection, right? You can meet your RPOs and RTOs any number of ways. Like we talked about a little earlier, we have continuous data protection, which is our near zero RPO replication. Uh, we're talking intervals in the seconds. We have virtual machine replicas, it's a software-based replication. Of course, we have traditional VM backups. And then of course, we integrate with a number of storage vendors to kind of ride on top of those storage snapshots and replication. So no matter how critical your data is, no matter what your RPO and RTO is, we have a way at Veeam to meet those numbers. It could be a combination of technologies. It really could be uh, a combination of vendors under the covers as well. It's all about meeting your business requirements and it's really flexible. Another thing I want to talk about uh, very briefly and back up in replication is that offline and immutable and air gap piece again, right? We want to have an ultra resilient copy of our data. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, some of my personal favorites, and I won't bore you with this whole chart, are immutable backups, right? Immutable backup means that my backup can't be modified or deleted. So we have a lot of S3 compatible storage systems or AWS S3 itself that will keep your data immutable. And then the hardened Linux repository as well, where you can build a repository that's immutable on commodity hardware running Linux, right? So there's a lot of different ways to make sure that you have that ultra resilient copy of your data. And if we take things a step further, that kind of ties into Veeam's scale out backup repository and we're kind of talking about immutability from start to finish, right? So we might have those performance tiers where we're talking about really, really fast storage. We're talking about something that's gonna restore really fast, maybe our last week's worth of data. We can use the hardened repository for immutability then. Then we can kind of tier things out to save a little money, right? We can go to the capacity tier where we're using S3 compatible storage or even Amazon S3 for lower cost storage options, but they're still immutable. And then we can all the way go to the archive tier where we're just kind of saying, hey, here's this data we don't anticipate touching for a long time. Let's send it to S3 Glacier and we're good to go. So 
The great part about this is everything is policy based. It's very much kind of set it and forget it and we're ready to go. And we can, again, have immutability throughout the life cycle of our data to help us if we do have a recovery event. And then it kind of comes to double and triple play immutability. What I just showed you is right. We want to have immutability at different stages of our data's life cycle. So we have that Linux immutable repository for our really, really um, aggressive RPOs, right? We're going to keep maybe like seven days worth of uh, data on site. It's there if we need it. And then again, we can kind of add that third tier of immutability with, you know, even worm tapes out of a library. The whole point of Veeam is that it's super flexible and there's a lot of ways to design this solution. Next, I wanna talk about monitoring. And I think I might make you think a little different here because when we talk about monitoring, what do people usually think of? They think of performance, they think of looking at CPU and memory, and if I'm looking at ESXi host, kind of looking at everything across my cluster and using DRS to make sure things are balanced. But when we talk about ransomware security in general, it's time to flip monitoring on its head a little bit and think a little differently. So first and foremost with Veeam, we wanna detect issues with data protection. So if something's wrong in our environment, we wanna know, and a lot of things could be wrong because we're humans, we're humans running this environment, right? So first and foremost, we need to ensure that all assets are protected with automated reporting. Using Veeam One, we can actually generate a report of your protected assets, your protected VMs. The report is literally called protected VMs, but what it shows you Besides what you're protecting is what is unprotected. And there's so many different ways that Veeam One can show you this. It can generate a report. We have it in our dashboards and we actually have alarms that can trigger the environment when we realize an, a VM or a group of VMs is not meeting a certain RPO or not protected by a certain RPO and automatic action can be taken. So Veeam One can come in there and say, you know what, we're automatically gonna add this VM to a catch all backup job with a 24 hour RPO and we're gonna run it to make sure that we don't have any issues when it comes recovery time and that asset's protected. We also need to make sure that our protection jobs are running and completed, right? If something's wrong in our environment, if a job is taking too long, that's something we wanna know for a couple of reasons. That might mean we you know, have a performance issue in our environment, or it might mean something's up with those VMs. If the the uh, backup job is suddenly processing so much more data, well, maybe things are changing, AKA encrypting, right? And we're gonna talk about alarms in a minute that can look for that. But there's lots of different things that we don't normally think of as unusual, or we think of, oh yeah, that's something I gotta fix, but it becomes really, really important to pay special attention when we're talking about the ransomware contact. The ransomware context, right? And again, we're gonna receive alerts and act automatically if issues are detected. There's lots of things we can actually use inside of Veeam One to make things do something based on our criteria. For example, if I trigger one of the ransomware alarms, I might wanna take action. So let's talk a little bit about that. Detecting signs of ransomware. So we wanna look for some of the signs and symptoms of ransomware and be alerted automatically. That makes sense, right? So out of the box, we have a possible ransomware activity alarm that'll tell us, hey, this VM is acting funny, it's doing a lot of writes, it has a lot of network transmitting, it has a high CPU, all signs that it might be encrypting something, let us know. We're gonna trigger that alarm and then we can do a number of things based on that alarm as well. You might wanna put in a script to disconnect the VM or run a sure backup job, that's Veeam's backup job verification technology, but run it with Secure Restore, which is our technology that allows you to restore clean copies of VMs to um, production, right? So Secure Restore will actually scan your VM for ransomware, see if anything's hiding in there and let you know, and then you can take action based on that. And again, that suspicious incremental backup size alarm, because if we see our backups are suddenly growing, that might mean Things are encrypting, right? There's more data to process. Usually that doesn't happen for no reason. And we might know in our environment, okay, the end of the month, the end of whatever, uh, we have reporting that runs, we generate more data, but if it's just kind of out of the blue, that's something we wanna look at. And you know, there's other things to keep in mind too when it comes to ransomware. We wanna monitor network performance. If we see things suddenly transmitting a ton of data, whether it be a VM or a host, 
That could be a sign of exfiltration, right? That could be a sign that somebody is copying data out of the environment. We wanna know about that. And the great thing about Veeam 1 is also you can build alarms based on any specific performance measures you want pretty much. You can group them together. And it's really powerful for how you set the alarms as well. So I love vSphere tags. I use them for categorizing my applications all the time. You can actually use VM, uh, you can actually use Veeam 1 to create groupings of VMs and then push tags to vCenter based on that grouping. So if I say, okay, I want VMs on this subnet with this name pattern, I want them in a group and then I wanna apply these tags to vCenter, go for it. Likewise, you can kind of suck down your vSphere tags into Veeam 1 if you already have them all set up. So Veeam 1 is really good at helping with that as well. And like I mentioned, and I need to mention this again because it's so important, is finding those unprotected virtual machines. We need to be protecting everything today so if something happens tomorrow, we know we're ready to recover. And another thing about monitoring is we need to use monitoring to make sure that we're ready for recovery. Monitoring recovery resources to make sure they're ready at a moment's notice. This is so, so important. I know uh, a lot of customers that have had like, okay, well, we're just gonna put our old host and our old storage and we don't have any support contracts, but that's gonna be our DR hardware because it's better than nothing. That's great, but you need to know what's going on there. Even if you're using great hardware in DR, if you have a, a vSphere host offline or you have an issue with your storage, right? All that kind of stuff. You need to be monitoring your DR site just like you would for production. And one thing I definitely wanna call it is pay special attention to licensing. I can't tell you how many times people just like forget to enter their licenses into their DR site for vSphere. I don't know why. I've done it too, honestly. It's like kind of you build the environment and you take a look at it and then you just walk away from it. And I've seen it in production too, right? Because vSphere always comes with that 60 day free trial. Some pe times people forget the licenses. So the last thing you wanna be doing on recovery day is trying to scramble to enter a license. Another thing to do is to check in on capacity. Do we have enough capacity to recover? We need to kind of keep track of our virtual machines and their requirements and regular DR testing can help. And I don't mean like DR testing where you kind of take a look at a VM and it runs and you say you did a DR test. I mean real world full scale disaster recovery testing because we need to do that to make sure that A, we have our capacity right, and B, to stress test our environment to make sure that we can actually recover everything as we intend to. We might say, okay, here's our um, application and the order we're gonna recover our applications in to meet our RTOs, but we might find that might not work. If we've got an application somewhere in there that's really just IO intensive or takes a long time to restore because it's so many VMs, things like that, we might need to stagger our recoveries. We might need to recover in a slightly different order. And the time is now to kind of figure all that out. And we're about to talk about testing a, quite a bit more in depth. So now let's talk about probably one of my favorites and it's something that I hope you never have to do, but I wanna talk about recovery and getting ready for recovery. So let's get started. Where does site level recovery fail? And I've seen this a lot of places, right? Uh, you run out of capacity because you didn't realize that you couldn't restore everything together because you've only done DR tests on one app at a time. You hit some kind of uh, issue with vSphere maximums. I think there's a max of like eight provisioning operations per host. I think it's eight. So if I have a limited number of hosts and I need to restore a ton of VMs, I might not actually be able to do it in time because there's just too many, right? The boot storm, booting servers is one of the most IO intensive things out there. Usually not a big deal on uh, SSD storage th these days, but it depends on what underlying storage you have. And then of course, crushing those backup repositories, right? We're suddenly doing all these restores or using instant VM recovery technology to start running off of those repositories and we might actually crush them, which is why it's so important to actually test that site level recovery for real before we need to do it. So. That sounds kind of difficult, right? But how do we actually do it? We do it with disaster recovery orchestration. So Veeam Disaster Recovery Orchestrator can 
uh, create the disaster recovery plans. It can check the RPOs and it can check the RTOs for any type of Veeam data protection. It's really an add-on to Veeam backup and replication, just like Veeam 1 is an add-on that gives you the monitoring. This is gonna give you orchestrated recovery with a couple different things, right? First and foremost, dynamic documentation. Orchestrator is gonna create and update your DR plans for you. It's gonna generate a document for you. You can automatically send it to key stakeholders and you're pretty much good to go at that point. You're done, you're ready. We've also got automated testing. So those full scale tests I talked about, we can run them in Orchestrator and more importantly, we can schedule them to run on a recurring basis. So I can say, okay, every Tuesday, I'm testing these five apps together, or every third Saturday of the month, I'm gonna schedule a full scale disaster recovery test. It's very, very simple to do. And again, it's gonna generate a report at the end. It's gonna generate a dynamic document that's gonna tell you, yes, you met your RPO, yes, you met your RTO, and here's what happened, or it's gonna tell you you didn't. And you know what, that's okay, because if we can't meet our RPOs and RTOs, we wanna know now before we actually have to recover, right? We wanna know that we can't meet these things so we can go back and fix things. Another great thing, which we'll go into depth a little more, is after I've run my disaster recovery test, I can actually leave my testing environment open. So when I run a DR test, I'm gonna create a completely isolated copy of my environment with no impact to production whatsoever. I can go back and leverage that, that environment for additional testing, and we'll talk about that more in a moment. And then finally, the one thing I hope you never have to do is the one-click recovery of your environment. We can actually chain plans together in Orchestrator, so you can literally architect your environment that I click one plan, I click run, and then they'll all run subsequently or you can run them one by one, what's up to you, but it's very simple to run a plan. Now, here's the funny part. If we talk about disaster recovery tests and running an actual disaster recovery event to recover, the workflows are so similar, it's not even funny. So the UI is an HTML5 based UI, it's very intuitive, it's easy to use, and if you run a disaster recovery test, running an actual recovery works almost exactly the same way. We can really get really granular with permissions and orchestrator as well. So we can empower those application owners to come in there and create their DR plans because they know their application the best. It's so simple to use and we can make sure that they can only see their applications with the steps they wanna run and their recovery resources as well. And then they can leverage that environment for pretty much anything that they would like to. They can leverage it for disaster recovery testing, um, patch testing, security testing, compliance and analytics runs, you know, kind of I just generally improve their IT services and operations with testing. And again, you have a fully isolated copy of your environment. You can do whatever you want to. You can test those new code updates. You can do just about anything. So it really unlocks the potential of your data and your disaster recovery resources too. I know how hard it is to get budget for disaster recovery because I've been there. A couple things you can use to help you along the way is of course, the fact that ransomware is a disaster and you're more likely to be hit by a ransomware attack than anything else. And you can prove that you're actually gonna use those DR resources for your disaster recovery testing and as a general sandbox environment, right? and kind of prove the value. You can say, hey, they're not just gonna sit here and collect dust. We're gonna do monthly DR testing. We're gonna do weekly application testing. We're gonna just go in and spin up environments for our uh, new people to train on. I mean, the possibilities really are endless here. And what do we do after we've done all of that? then we're gonna test again. And I'm not joking, right? We need to test at scale to simulate the real world recovery. We need to test different recovery environments. So within Orchestrator, you build something called a recovery location, which is just a logical grouping of your resources. So it's your uh, vSphere hosts, your storage, and any kind of net network mapping or re-IPing rules. You might need to test out different vSphere clusters. Maybe you're running different generations of hardware and you wanna compare speeds and feeds, right? You have different storage in your vSphere environment. You might have a single cluster backed by several different types of array. You can test your application across different types of storage as well. Uh, you can change that recovery location you configure anytime you actually go to run a disaster recovery plan 
or when you go in and actually do a test. So I can test against different scenarios to, again, make sure that I'm always meeting those RPOs and RTOs and figure out things I might need to change ahead of time. And then once we have everything working, we're gonna keep testing automatically. We're just gonna simply schedule a disaster recovery test to run whenever we need it to. And you know what? I actually just wanna show you real quick how simple it is to run a disaster recovery test. So let's pop over to my lab for a minute. Let's see how easy it is to run a disaster recovery test with Veeam Disaster Recovery Orchestrator. I'm going to select the plan I wanna test and I'm gonna say verify and run data lab test. We have a couple options here. We can run a quick test or a full test. A quick test is going to use the instant VM recovery technology and it's going to be super, super fast. This is great if you plan on using instant VM recovery on disaster day, or if you have a new DR plan, you just really need to do a quick test on it and see what's going to happen. A full test is a full real world test where we're gonna do the full restores of your virtual machines. This is an essential test to run to really understand your real world RTO under different scenarios. Today, we're just gonna run a quick test though. We're gonna pick the Veeam data lab that we're gonna use to run our disaster recovery test. I have the ability to choose my recovery location. We might have different recovery locations based on different criteria. So I'm actually going to pick my ransomware recovery location. And that's just a recovery location that my network is mapped to an isolated vSphere network on the de destination side. So if there was a ransomware event, I might wanna recover in a manner to a fully isolated network. So we're gonna test that here. We have a couple of power options. So I can power off immediately after I'm done testing, or I can power off the test after a number of hours. I'm gonna set this to eight hours because I want to leave this test running for eight hours to allow my application team access to a copy of their production environment, right? So they can come in here, they can test any patches if there's any new vulnerabilities or exploits out there. They can taste application upgrades, they can do security testing, or they might just wanna hand over this lab to a new person on the team to get them used to the environment and let them you know, look around and test things and break things without impacting production. So there's really endless scenarios for having a copy of your production environment running that's completely non-disruptive. You can just kind of go in there and do whatever you want and it's all torn down and thrown away after the end. Next, we're going to choose our lab groups. All lab groups are, are any supporting virtual machines that you might need in your disaster recovery test. So you might need AD or DNS, or you might have a specific uh, SQL server that's shared between multiple applications. You could put it in here so it would spin up in your environment and be available. We're not gonna choose a lab group right now. We're gonna click next. We're gonna click summary. We're gonna click finish. And that's it, that's all there is to it. In less than three minutes, I've shown you how easy it is to run a disaster recovery test. And if we click through the orchestrator UI, we'll actually see what is going on our, during our disaster recovery test. We can see that our data lab is powering on and now our disaster recovery test is just gonna run and do its thing. And the best part is at the end, we're gonna have a data lab test report that'll tell us that we've met our RPOs and RTOs, of course, because we're always doing this testing. And that report can be automatically sent to key stakeholders. Okay, so let's review what we've talked about today so far. We are ready for ransomware. And why are we ready for ransomware? Because we know that we're a target. We know those ransomware operators are going after our virtual machines and our VMware environments. So not only are we backing up and protecting our virtual machines, we know how to rapidly recover our vSphere environments if we need to, and we have alternatives planned of different places we can recover in the event of a disaster. After that, what we need to do is create those disaster recovery plans and test them on a regular basis. We need to monitor our environment for things like virtual machines we're not protecting so we can select the appropriate data protection for them. And then last, but certainly not least, we're gonna constantly run checks and tests in our environment to make sure that we're ready for ransomware at any moment. 
Thank you so much for joining me today. And if you have any questions, we have someone to answer them and you can reach out to me on Twitter at Vemus33.